Hi and welcome to my channel, I'm Simon and today I am back to have a chat with you about my favourite non-fiction by women. I have 16 books here that I've read over the last how many years. I've got a couple, well four, honourable mentions, one of which you could win a signed dedicated copy of. I'll tell you more about that in a little bit. The reason that I decided to make this video now is because as this goes live, the news that there is going to be a women's prize for non-fiction, which I am so excited about. I'm excited about it for several reasons, seeing as you so kindly asked. The first of those is just that like, it's another women's prize prize. That's super duper exciting. For any of you who've been around for any length of time, I'm sure you'll know that I absolutely love the women's prize. It's one of my favorite of all the prizes. So for them to have a sister prize celebrating nonfiction is fantastic, especially because I'm not very good at reading nonfiction. I had a real love affair with it in sort of 2018, 2019, and I've read a little bit since, but not masses, although I am getting back into the swing of it this year with the honorable mentions that I will honourably mention shortly. But it's not something I've tended to head to massively. And I think in part that's because of all of the whole like shenanigans that have been going on since 2020. And the fact that I was watching so much news, I didn't really want to read anything that felt factual. But it's definitely something I am in the mood for again and would love recommendations, which lead to my honourable mentions because Obviously at the moment, I have no idea what the rules are for the prize. How is the long list gonna be 16? Just because it is for the fiction prize, it might not be for the non-fiction. But what I will do is, editing Simon will pop in shortly. He will tell you all about any sort of info that he's got, because as I'm recording this at the moment, it's actually 7 a.m. on Wednesday and it still hasn't been announced yet. So I'm awaiting the news officially going out. Hey everyone, it is Editing Simon as promised. It's Thursday morning, the prize announcement got delayed a day. So I have seen now the press release for the Women's Prize for Nonfiction, and interestingly, it's gonna run alongside the Women's Prize for Fiction. So the long list will be announced at two different points in the spring, and then the winners will be celebrated and announced together in June. I think that's interesting because I get that they're trying to highlight lots of women's writing at the same time because also they do their discoveries for new voices. But I think it would be better to do it separately because if the long list for the Women's Prize for Nonfiction is 16 as well, that's 32 books. And who's going to read all of those books apart from the judges? And I will say, like, I'm insane to read all 16 of the long list, but I love doing it with mum. And I would be more likely to do it again with the non-fiction if it was later in the year rather than earlier. Not that this is all about me, obviously. It's a great way of shouting about lots of women writers, which I think is brilliant. But I would almost have probably done it over a year just so that it isn't one isn't drowning the other out necessarily. So yeah, anyway, that's just my thoughts. I'm very excited either way because I think it's fabulous that they're doing it. It doesn't say how many books will be long listed, it doesn't give exact dates yet, and it doesn't say whether there may be, like with the Stella Prize, a honorary male judge or whether it's going to be all women again like with the women's prize for fiction so all that i'm sure will be announced soon but i'm super excited i do think i would have done it over two different time periods but i'm not in charge i'm just a fan so on that note i'm going to head back to the women's non-fiction reads that i've read that i've also been a fan of wasn't that glamorous wasn't that fabulous wasn't that lovely let's talk about non-fiction books by women that I've loved and I'm going to mention the honourable mentions including the first book which if you would like a dedicated signed copy of this book leave a comment below telling me what your favourite non-fiction by a woman or women is and that I would really love not just a book that's just your favourite but a favourite that will also possibly be a favourite of mine because they can be two different things and you could be in with a chance of getting I feel like I'm hosting like a daytime show here's a giveaway I've held it up long enough now so you know what it is Kate Moss's Warrior Queens and Quiet Revolution series which I absolutely loved that I read very recently and this came about when Kate asked out on social media for women who have either been silenced by the archives or have been maybe overshadowed by another historical female figure because history tends to just pick one whereas it will pick like five men who've all done something similar and celebrate them or 
just a lesser known woman from history who did something amazing. And that became half of this book. The other half is a fascinating look into Kate's great grandmother, Lily, who was an author and in her heyday was a bestseller, but has been kind of completely erased from history until Kate went to looking into her works. So it's just brilliant. I absolutely loved it. Can't recommend it enough. It's one of those books that also makes you just want to go and read loads of other books about all of these women. Well, where there are some and it's just fab. So yeah, if you want to win that, I've told you how you can. Now, next up are two books by the same author and I don't often read the same author back to back, but I did because she was also on Scars from Hay as Kate was, and that is Emma Dabbery. And I have both What White People Can Do Next. Oh, and as you can see, I've been tabbing. I've become a tabbing girly. I don't know if this is gonna stick or not, but also these do make brilliant bookmarks as well, which is why that's at the back of the book. Anyway, the subtitle of this book is From Allyship to Coalition. And this was brilliant. It's told in bite-sized mini essays that Emma has written about her thoughts on allyship, the problems with allyship or the performative nature that allyship can sometimes take and how actually it shouldn't be about allyship, it should be about coalition. And it just blew my mind. It was fantastic and to get to talk to her about it was amazing. I also listened to, so no tabs here, uh, Don't Touch My Hair, which is Emma looking at the cultural history of black hair and how it has been used in the mainstream and how people have certain reactions to it and what she does through this is give such a fascinating insight into Oh, so much. It's got philosophy in it, it's got maths in it, it's got a lot of wit and humour in it as well. I remember Lauren of Lauren the Books absolutely loved it when she read it and I meant to read it then and I can totally see why because I was just, it's one of those books that expands your brain, gives you a good chuckle and leaves you kind of, one, wanting to go and read more. I thought this was brilliant too, absolutely brilliant. And then I wanted to mention Melanie Sykes' Illuminated, Autism and the Things I've Left Unsaid. And this book is very emotional in the sense that it looks back at her life and career, tells you what's gone on, but also how seeing th things through an autistic lens, it, it, how can I put it? It, it shines a light in different ways on what's happened in the past. And that to me was sort of both heartbreaking, but also really empowering to read. I can't quite explain it. And I think the way that she's done it is brilliant. It's also just full of Melanie, which I just love. It's very much her voice. It's like having a chat with her and that is always a joy. So yeah, I wanted to mention that one. Now, moving on to, and actually the first one links with um, Melanie because I've put all of these books in order of author's surname, just because, you know, they're all favourites. So I can't pick a particular one favourite out of all of these, but also they're a real mixture. And the first one I actually read for book club when me and Melanie had one, and hopefully we're going to be doing something podcasty together in the future. But when we did book club we read I'm an Island by Tamsin Kalidas. This book was just phenomenal and I don't think I would have read this if it hadn't been for Melanie suggesting it for book club and it's just amazing. It's about how Tamsin moves away from London after a, a really horrible incident to the Scottish Hebrides to get away from it all and set up a farm and it's how she and her partner are treated as incomers but also it is how her and her partner's relationship, the tiny little fractures within it suddenly become much bigger and in parts it can be incredibly hard to read. It's beautifully brutal, which is something that I just love in books. I might do a video on brutally beautiful books because they do tend to become absolute favourites of mine, but you're totally with Tamsin through these experiences and, oh, I just, yeah, it's one of those books that kind of takes your breath away. It's really hard to read, but you can't stop reading it. Utterly phenomenal. Then we have another book that I found brutally beautiful, and that is The Terrible by Ursa Daly Ward, who, this book is all about 
all the terrible experiences or thoughts or moments that she's had in her life and yet how she has I don't know how they've built her, how they have strengthened her, how at some points they have destroyed her about how she's picked herself up from that. And I just thought it was phenomenal. It's a perfect book to read actually during Pride Month as well, as it looks at us uh, and her sexuality. It's not just about her sexuality though, it's also about her childhood growing up in the North. And I think that Northernness chimed with me. But yeah, I just think it is absolutely fantastic. And if you haven't read it, you really, really need to. I will try to remember to write all of these down below. Now, if you were thinking, Simon, you read Elizabeth Day's Friendaholic earlier this year. Why did you not mention it? That was shady. It's not, but it's because I was going to share How to Fail with you, which is the first book of Elizabeth that I read before I got to know her. And this book, there's one particular chapter about divorce that chimes so strongly with me as a divorcee too, that I just messaged Elizabeth and was like, oh my goodness, I just, yeah, I had that with it. And that's how we started chatting. The power of a good book. But this doesn't just look at divorce, it looks at all sorts of different failures and how failure is not a bad thing. Sometimes we need to fail in order to move on, in order to change, in order to even like sort of take a step back from everything and rethink. It's very much about the power of hindsight, I will say. So it's not like you instantly feel like that after you failed at something, but it's brilliant. And also again, it's that conversational, frank openness that I really, really, really enjoyed about this. Then we have Natalie Haynes' Pandora's Jar, which I believe there is a sequel-ish coming later this year, which is going to instantly, I've forgotten the title of it now, but I'm very, very excited about it. It's one of my, I want to say it's about divine something, but it's one of my most anticipated books of the year. This is looking at the women in classical myth, all the different ways in which they've been written about, generally by men, giving that sort of question mark as to why these women have been described as they have but I just couldn't get enough of it and what I really really loved was how there's almost like now they almost creates this sort of I don't want to say core narration because it's not multiple voices but it's just this way that she steps in while you're reading and adds these extra layers and her passion and love for classical mythology just comes right through. I thought this was utterly, utterly, utterly brilliant. And yeah, I can't recommend it enough. Then we have some Australian non-fiction. This is The Arsonist by Chloe Hooper, A Mind on Fire. And this looks at some of the horrific bushfires in Australia and how one specific incident of these bushfires was started by one specific person. And this book doesn't, this book isn't a book, it is a book, but it's not a book that tries to excuse someone's behaviour. It looks at why somebody would behave in the way they did that they would do something like this. Why would they cause arson on such a mass scale that was so devastating? Again, quite a hard book to read in parts, but utterly, utterly phenomenal. And looks at mental health, looks at nature and the environment, and looks at human nature, but also our capacity to not forgive, but to try to understand and how that may make things better in the future. Really, really, really powerful. We have Kerry Hudson's Lowborn. I love this book. The subtitle is Growing Up, Getting Away and Returning to Britain's Poorest Towns. And Kerry grew up on the, well, I was going to say breadline, but in poverty when she was younger. And it looks at her life going into care, the relationship that she has with her family through that, but also what it's like to be poor in the UK, which is something I think people either flinch at instantly or try and look away from and this book you just can't you have to face it head on and Carrie actually goes back to the places of her childhood but she goes back to the places of her childhood several decades on and looks at the memories of those places but also what's happened to them and it is utterly brilliant so another 
highly recommended. Then we have The Trauma Cleaner by Sarah Krasnostein, one of my absolute favourite non-fiction books of all time. This is all about a woman called Sandra Pankhurst who Sarah gets to know sort of randomly but becomes really interested in. Sandra is a trauma cleaner. She goes and cleans up after murders or the death of someone who nobody's noticed has died for quite a long time or hoarders and cleans everything up. But also Sandra's fascinating in the fact that she is a trans woman who went through a really difficult time in Australia. This looks at how tough it was for Sandra, but also gives us insight into some of the people that Sandra cleans up after. And I just think, again, what a phenomenal, phenomenal book that looks at society, human nature, our foibles, our, well, celebrates our individuality and our differences, but also looks at what it's like to be an outsider and just feels othered from being an outsider, if that makes sense. Utterly, utterly phenomenal. Great book. Another brilliant Australian non-fiction book is The Erratics by Vicky Laveau Harvey. And this is the story of Vicky and her relationship with her mother, who has severe mental health issues that were incredibly detrimental to Vicky as a child. It looks at Vicky sort of trying to reconcile and reckon with all of that. And it looks at how, well, there's an incident where she has to go back to see her parents and is shocked by what she discovers. And I won't say any more than that, other than, again, absolutely incredible book. Incredible, 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 incredible. And a lot of these books, I would say, have sort of changed... I think there are certain fiction books that can change your perception. I think a lot of fiction can change your perception. You are walking in the footsteps of other people. You are experiencing all different walks of life from the safety of your sofa chair, wherever you choose to read. There is something though that gives it a slight distance, which can be good because sometimes things can be really hard. So there you can go, oh, that's a fictional account though. But there is something about hearing people's true life stories or real things that have happened that I think can shift your soul just a tiny little bit more when it's super duper good. That could be a controversial thought. Well, it could not be, it might not be controversial, but that could be a thought that many of you don't agree with. We can have a chat about that down in the comments down below, I'm sure. But yeah, it's just, that is how I feel. Like for me, when I really, really, really love nonfiction, like I really love it. Although that said, I don't think there's ever been a non-fiction book that has been my book of the year. I think there was one year when I was reading lots of it that I did a separate video. But anyway, that's by the by. What's the next book, Simon? It's this. It's In the Dream House by Carmen Maria Machado, which I thought was another phenomenal book, obviously, because I'm mentioning it in this. This book is really experimental in the best of ways. Sorry, I've still got hay fever, so I've got very itchy eyes every so often. Oh, the struggle is real. Oh, I'm there. Oh Lord, don't itch them, don't itch them. It makes them worse. Anyway, so this book is so brilliantly crafted because it looks at a relationship that Carmen Maria Machado was in with a, another woman that was abusive. And through different genres, she tells you kind of what went on. So you will have Dream House as an accident, which is a very short one. There's lots of vignettes in here, which I really, really like. You will have Dream House as Diagnosis, Dream House as Modern Art, Dream House as a half credit. I don't know what that means. Oh, oh. Then you've got this bit at the end where you have to go to different pages, almost like a choose your own adventure, but it's not an adventure. There's all these different ways in which she looks at the situation in hindsight with these varying different sort of almost this is going to sound really bonkers but like lenses of genre and I just thought it was phenomenal. I think I've said phenomenal about 55 times in this video already. Now one of my all-time favourite books um, non-fiction wise is a book that I described when I read it and I think this is what Emma Dabry was actually also doing a little bit and I should have said then but this book kind of took the lid off my head, poured loads of ideas into it, 
popped the lid back on, shook it and said, go away and have a think about all of that and come back to me later. And I haven't gone back to it yet, but I still think about this book. It still brings up little questions or thoughts or whatever. And I love the sort of ripples of the after effects of that. And I will read it again at some point. It's The Argonauts by Maggie Nelson, which looks at her... Well, it's about queer family. It's about bodies. Perfect book again for Pride. Um, although, as I always say, like you shouldn't just be reading queer books during Pride. You should be reading queer books all year round because queer people aren't queer just for a month. I just thought this was phenomenal. And it's almost a book that I, I find incredibly difficult to describe because there's just so much in it and I remember reading it and thinking I don't know if I'm 100% clever enough for this and I'm still debating that fact but it's definitely one that has left such an impression and the way that Maggie talks about her getting pregnant her partner transitioning um and also this thing around queer family found family yeah it's just brimming with brilliant thoughts and ideas and talking points and phenomenal <laughs> then we have Maggie O'Farrell who has won the women's prize for fiction may well win it again for a second time next week i should say actually there's not going to be a reading vlog of me reading the women's prize shortlist because i don't have the time or capacity to edit it um i don't know if it's something that i'll do post event it feels a little bit daft to and i'm well aware i still haven't edited me and mum's parallel read of demon copperhead that will come at some point that feels less timely because i feel like people are going to be talking about demon copperhead all year round anyway sorry moving on back to this this is i am i am i am 17 brushes with death this looks at 17 times where maggie has had death at pro pros proximity no death at close proximity and it's some of them I will say are a little tenuous but I still enjoyed every single part of this book the way it looks at how there's such a thin line between life and death and how that could you know it's a bit sliding doorsy I guess how one little move can change everything so much that I found, I guess it looks at the precarious of the precarious nature of life, but also how we should celebrate life. It's not a book that if you read it, you can wait just thinking, oh my God, I'm gonna die, which is the only guarantee in life. But it's a book that makes you think, goodness, I should celebrate life more. And I will say, Anna has done a brilliant chat recently about after having read this, she shares the story of how she almost swallowed her tongue and nearly died. So that was, you know, not only did I get inside, to Maggie's life through this book. I got inside to Anna's too. Then one of my, another of my all time favorite, well, they all are all time favorite favorites is My Mess is a Bit of a Life by Georgia Pritchett, Adventures in Anxiety. Georgia Pritchett is a comedy writer and also writes for, well, Succession is what she's most known for writing. She also wrote Spice World, so there we go. And this is, a fantastic book. It's told through vignettes, um, which I really, really love. The humour in here is massive. I was reading this actually in Wales and it was like there was mini earthquakes going on in Wales just because of my laughter. When I read this, I just laughed a lot, but I was also so moved. It looks at George's life growing up, um, actually from a little bit pre birth which is brilliantly done and goes to her history of being a writer for tv and what that's been like as a woman also leading up to the success that she's having with things like succession but also it's a look at her personal life and her relationships and becoming a mother and i just thought it was so so brilliant another great book for pride just to say and i think this is one of the non-fiction books that i bought the most copies of for other people because i just think it's one that everyone will get and it does look at anxiety and how she has fought against that and i love the fact that she says adventures in anxiety so there is this real positive outlook even though some of the book is really difficult and tricky but it's still phenomenal so stop doing that actually i'm not because this next book is also phenomenal and this is the five by honey rubenhold the untold lives of the women killed by jack the ripper now this book does something so incredible in just casting a whole new light on history because when it comes to jack the ripper who has weirdly and how he looks at this become 
kind of this cultural icon, even though he was a serial killer and clearly fucked up. She tells the story of the victim's lives and actually cuts Jack out of it completely. And I thought that was a brilliant move. I had thought, like I'm sure many people do because of the narrative around Jack the Ripper, that all of his victims were prostitutes. Not the case at all. And the different walks of life that these five women came from and how they have just ended up becoming these horrific pictures. And it's how that's kind of become this, yeah, cultural phenomenon and questions that and delves into their lives. And I felt gave them their place in history that they need. And Holly has recontextualised them, which I think is super duper important. So yeah, phenomenal. So next up is a book that if you want a non-fiction book that just gives you the biggest, warmest hug and sends you off on a detective mission where you're Watson to someone utterly fabulous, you need to read the Adventures of Maud West, Lady Detective by Susanna Stapleton. Maud West is a woman who was very much overlooked by history, but was this incredible lady detective. She would dress up as all sorts of different characters, as you can see here, and go off and investigate things. Now, there is some questionable stuff around her investigations and some of the crimes that she believed that she solved, which also becomes part of the brilliance and joy of reading it. But what's so wonderful is, because she was such an enigma, Susanna goes off almost on like, well, no, it's not even almost. She goes off on a detective quest of her own to find out like, who was Maud? Who was this woman? And her narration is so joyful, wry, knowing, camp, fabulous, that you just have the best time with her. And I absolutely love this and I want everyone to read it. And I really, really want to see another book from Susanna Stapleton. So yeah, there we go, there's that one. Penultimately, another true crime uh, non-fiction book and one that is... So if you've got kind of a cosy one, you'd go for this one. If you're after something a bit grittier, then I would say that this, and actually Kate Moss talked about this in her latest Moss on a Monday video, which I'll link down below because she has a channel, which is fabulous. And I agree with what she said completely and the fact that I think this might be a near perfect non-fiction true crime. I could have just said true crime, I don't really need to say non-fiction. And that is The Suspicions of Mr. Witcher or The Murder at Road at Hill House by Kate Summerscale. I read this the year it came out, which is quite a while ago. I mean, it's even gone a little bit blotchy there. I don't know why that happens to some books and not others, because I've got quite a few old books and materials. 2008. So this came out in 2008, and I absolutely devoured it. It It's set around a murder that happened at Roadhill House. It was one of the first murder... Well, it was one of the first murders that ended up having a detective. So this was at the beginning of what we now know as detectives. And Mr. Witcher comes on the scene and he, well, nothing, hmm, how do I talk about this without spoilers? There's basically a murder of a young child. He comes to investigate and as he does so, lots and lots of secrets about this family are brought to life. And then, what I found haunting about this book was not only how that was all written about, but then it's the, it's what comes later. That's all I'm going to say that I found deeply haunting about it. But I just thought this was so well done. It reads like a novel, which I really, really love when I'm reading nonfiction. I know that sounds a bit daft, but it's true. It, narrative nonfiction is one of my absolute favourites. It's very much about the real people and how they're all affected in all sorts of different ways, but also just a fascinating time in history when detectives were beginning to be a thing. So yeah, I've probably pitched that really badly. Kate does it better, so go and watch her video about it. And then last but not least, I couldn't not mention Three Women by Lisa Tadeo, which I just thought was incredible phenomenal. Oh, I feel like I've just used all those words really, really boringly. I'm so sorry. This is about three women. They're all, and like I was just saying, 
I really like books about real people. I know celebrities are real people, but you know what I mean. Anyway, but this is about three women from three different walks of life and it looks at the situations they find themselves in. What links these three stories is they're all looking at women and sexual desire in different ways. So we have one woman who is married with children, her husband doesn't want to touch her. We have another woman who has had an affair with her teacher. And then we have one woman who has basically become a sexual object to her husband and other men and actually ends up in situations where she's watched by her husband and other men having sex with other men and women. It's just so thought-provoking and just, it, it, it's one of those books that I love because it kind of, it was almost like you were, I'm not a curtain twitcher per se, I mean I'll look through a window when I pass a house, you can't not sometimes can you? But this does feel like you are literally in these women's households, in their lives, in some of their most intimate moments or not in one case and just I don't know, I just found it really, really different, but also really compelling, also really hard to read, brutally beautiful again. Although I think maybe more brutal than beautiful in parts, but that's kind of the whole point. And it's a book that I still think of quite often. I haven't read any of her others and I should, I should, I should. I should and I will at some point but yeah I just thought this was brilliant and it was a bit of a um, book of a time like everyone seemed to be reading now but there's a reason why that is. I think it shows the gritty reality of what it is like for some people, well these three women, but actually how that's probably going on, or not even probably, that will be going on with a lot more women and that I think is possibly why the book sort of sang to so many. Anyway, there we go. That is 16 and four honourable mentions of my favourite non-fiction books by women. As I was doing this, I was thinking there were so many others, like I love Joanna Cannon's non-fiction, I love Mary Roach's non-fiction, actually I should have maybe include one of those. There's just so many, but it's got me all excited about it. So, like I said, I would love in the comments below for you to let me know of some of your favourite non-fiction by women, but also I would love to know a non-fiction book by a woman that you think I would absolutely love, that I would really love. It, it, like I said, it could be one of your favourites, but that might not automatically mean it's one of mine, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. I don't know why I'm overthinking it. I am. I would love your thoughts on any of the books that I've mentioned in the comments below too. Let's keep chatting. And if you want to head to my TikTok, my Patreon, my Instagram, my wish list, my new channel, any of those things, they're all linked down below. If you want to give this a thumbs up, do. If you want to subscribe, that'd be lovely too. Thank you as always for joining me for a good old chin wag about books. Let me know in the comments below all the things that I've asked you to already and I will see you in another video very, very soon. Bye.